Tom Starzl is often referred to as the father of liver transplantation, but to view his career in this context would be to overlook its much broader significance. While others have contributed to the evolution of transplantation and immunology, there are few instances in which a single individual has been so predominantly responsible for establishing a new field. While growing up in a small town in Iowa, Tom Starzl enjoyed the usual activities of other boys. He also began to hone his skills as a writer by working on the town's newspaper, which was owned and published by his father. Inspired by his mother, a nurse, he began to think about a career in medicine. During medical school at Northwestern, Starzl developed a serious interest in neuroscience and dropped out for a year of full-time research at UCLA, which resulted in a PhD in neurophysiology. As a surgical resident at Johns Hopkins, he developed a model of complete heart block in dogs and its treatment with the first epicardial pacemaker. As he was finishing his residency in Miami, Dr. Starzl turned his attention to the liver. At first, his research in dogs was not aimed at liver transplantation as a potential therapy, but at using the procedure to study changes in the liver and its metabolism if it was deprived of nutrients and other elements in portal blood. I got a, a lab, a garage, and built a lab down there in Miami while I was at that time still a senior resident and was investigating the effect of the kind of blood used to uh, nourish the liver. Liver transplantation uh, entered by that back door. Liver transplantation was a good way to study this physiology and uh, so in order to do that I developed the operation known as liver transplantation, liver replacement. Uh, and I did that by hooking up the liver in different ways, different kinds of blood supply. So um, uh, all that took place um, at a time when there had not been any kind of organ transplantation, never had been a successful kidney transplantation from anyone other than an identical twin. So um, it was during that period in which there was nothing but a giant vacuum uh, that the operation of liver transplantation was developed just for physiologic studies. But then, by the end of the time, and, and that period of time was 1958 to 1960, for the first time, experimental drugs showed up on the horizon. And I thought, wow, um, this operation that I developed for other reasons could be used to treat people that um, uh, were dying of liver failure. During the next three years at Northwestern University, Starzl continued to work on liver transplantation in dogs. One curious observation was quite provocative. So the uh, models uh, were in uh, unmodified animals, animals that uh, were, received no immunosuppression. So basically, the real opportunity here was for the first time to study the rejection patterns of, uh, liver, of liver allografts. Now one of the uh, interesting observations that uh, was made in, in those untreated animals that we encountered an occasional recipient who rejected, uh, who, became, who became jaundiced and then spontaneously recovered or started to recover. So even before the availability of uh, immunosuppression, we, or I at least, uh, uh, had a very clear idea that rejection was potentially, even without treatment, uh, spontaneously uh, reversible. In 1962, Starzl moved to the University of Colorado. In dogs transplanted with liver or kidney, he tested the new immunosuppressive drug Imuran. As others had found, Imuran, if given alone, delayed but did not prevent rejection. But by treating with prednisone, Starzl discovered he could reverse rejection. For the first time, 
achieving consistent success. So I obtained a supply of uh, uh, Imuran pr probably about a year after uh, 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 Roy had the drug and had tested it in uh, London and then with Joe Murray in Boston. And I uh, made some observations that were completely missed by the people that had their first crack at the drug. I had treated always with Imuran alone, and then only when rejection developed in the dogs did I add the steroids. And uh, I found that rejection was always reversible, or essentially 95% uh, of the time was reversible. And that sometimes you could then stop the steroids, and to our amazement, most of the liver recipients did not reject. Encouraged by these animal results, he began to perform human kidney transplants. He was pleased to find that his unique immunosuppressive protocol was just as effective in humans, resulting in consistent survival of their kidney transplants. This landmark finding came at a crucial time. Until then, the results of others had been so poor that continuation of human trials was violently controversial being labeled by many as futile or even unethical. I think the greatest liability in terms of professional criticism and disgrace uh, was with our first cases of kidney transplantation because the perception was at that time worldwide, uh, the perception was that this couldn't work. It had been tried. Uh, there had been a number of cases tried, perhaps as many as um, 200 around the world at Harvard and um, in Europe, in France, in England at the Hammersmith Hospital and also at UCLA and all of, in Canada also, Cleveland, they had all failed. And the people that had made these efforts were by and large extremely pessimistic. This was still in 1962. We were watching uh, what was going on in Boston, and we were in communication uh, uh, with the people in Boston about what was going on with the clinical, first clinical trials of Imuran, the results from which were, were, were very poor. Um, at, at the Brigham, I think they did um, the combination of the Imuran trials at the Brigham and uh, in England by Roy, they did four cases in England, um, uh, were, were uh, quite discouraging. There was only a single patient uh, out of the first uh, uh, 14 or 15 that lasted for as long as six months. And those uh, were all terminated by death. So um, uh, it, it looked like the, the, um, uh, the, the field was, the kidney field was dead in the water. In 1963, Starzl presented his results at a small conference of the National Research Council. It was a watershed event. About 25 of the world's established transplant experts were gathered to share their experiences. About 200 human kidney transplants in all. The results were terrible. Only 10% of the recipients had survived three months and only six had lived a year. Immunosuppression for most had been whole body radiation. It was now hoped that the new drugs would bring improvement. But of Joe Murray's 10 Imuran-treated patients, only one had survived six months. Thus, it appeared that the new drugs were no better than radiation. The mood at the conference was so gloomy that it was considered whether further human trials could be justified. Gloom at the conference was then dispelled by the presentation of Tom Starzl who was a newcomer to the field. He described 30 patients with 80% success. This was more surviving patients than the rest of the world's experts combined. Skeptics in the audience became convinced by charts that he brought tracking the daily progress and lab studies of the recipients. Starzl's presentation caused a sensation and completely changed the outlook for transplantation. Boston transplant surgeon and historian Nick Tilney said it was like letting the genie out of the bottle. 
Many of the conference attendees promptly followed Starzl to Denver to learn his methods. His immunosuppressive protocol then became the world standard for the next two decades. So um, we came along armed with some information from the experimental laboratory about drug combinations and made that operation of kidney transplantation just work almost routinely. And uh, that, um, it created a revolution in the field. And not only that, we did something, uh, we had demonstrated that rejection, the big barrier was reversible. No one had known that before. And also uh, some of our animals where we, when we stopped drugs, uh, didn't reject. So um, uh, uh, this looked like a pathway that would lead to liver transplantation, but then the ceiling fell. Despite his extensive experience with liver transplantation in dogs, achievement of success of the procedure in humans proved to be very difficult. In 1963, Starzl's first patient bled to death on the table. The next four survived the operation, but died early deaths from infection. At this stage, most people might have followed the advice of their colleagues to give up. But instead, Starzl, during a three-year self-imposed moratorium, refined his technique in animal experiments and introduced a new immunosuppressive agent, anti-lymphocyte serum. These adjustments allowed Starzl to perform the world's first successful liver transplant in 1967. Three early recipients are shown here by Starzl's fellow of the time, Carl Groth. Other successes followed, but for another decade the procedure remained only a qualified success. So uh, uh, between 1967 and the time I moved to uh, uh, Pittsburgh, or until the time that, that uh, cyclosporin became available, uh, was 1967 to uh, the tail end of, um, of, uh, of, of, of uh, 1979. So there was a long period of time in which there were multiple successes, but the uh, survival rate was only 50%. Right. And uh, losing half the liver recipients, uh, uh, not just from loss of graft, but from death in the first uh, uh, during the first year was, uh, uh, was a very tough uh, uh, pill to keep swallowing. In 1979, the miracle drug cyclosporin was introduced by Roy Kalm. First used as a single agent, this drug was potent but so toxic that it might have been abandoned. But Starzl rescued it. By lowering the dose and combining it with prednisone, he showed that it greatly improved results. Another of his landmark contribution. Uh, there was a great deal of, uh, uh, of uh, debate. The cyclosporin story uh, you're very familiar with. Cyclosporin was introduced first and then the uh, uh, Sandoz uh, had actually made a decision to take it off the market because of the tremendous toxicity of the drug as it was originally used. Uh, but that change really did revolutionize liver transplantation uh, because the one-year survival before then would had been about uh, only one in three. Afterwards it was two out of three or the better. The technology has become so perfect uh, and so useful in the treatment of uh, human disease that there is an enormous demand for it. It's not some weird little thing that uh, gets done once in a while. Uh, it's a, it's a viable it's a, treatment. Oh, it's a tremendous advance. And um, conceptually, it's maybe the greatest advance, advance ever in the history of medicine. In 1981, Starzl moved from Colorado to the University of Pittsburgh. Over the next decade, he and his team worked at a furious pace. They performed as many as 600 transplants a year. Their results continued to improve, especially after 1989 when Starzl introduced tacrolimus, a new drug which has now become the standard. The level of success with liver transplantation soon reached 90% or better. Liver transplantation 
now was no longer considered an experiment, but an established therapy. A few of Starzl's other accomplishments during this period included initiation of intestinal transplantation, the first successful pancreatic islet allografts, demonstration that liver replacement would cure many inherited metabolic abnormalities, and elucidation of the liver's control of lipid metabolism. In 1990, Starzl stopped operating and from then on devoted his full time to research. His aim now was to explain why rejection was reversible, why allografts ever worked, and whether tolerance could reduce or eliminate the need for chronic immunosuppression. In 1992, Starzl discovered that the key to these questions was chimerism. This was another landmark finding, one that was at least as important as his other breakthroughs. In this lecture, he describes these findings. In 1992, a search was made at this hospital and uh, especially at Presbyterian for donor leukocytes in 30 kidney or liver recipients. These patients had borne functioning grafts for up to three decades using sensitive immunocytochemical and or PCR techniques donor leukocytes were detected in one or more of the recipients sites shown in this liver recipient um, uh, in the blood of all 30 tested patients. Because these cells were sparse, their presence was called microchimerism. The discovery in 1992 of microchimerism signaled a paradigm shift in transplantation for decades, it had been assumed that since allograft survival could often be attained without administration of donor cells, chimerism must be irrelevant. Starzl's demonstration of donor cell microchimerism in long-standing recipients indicated otherwise. The finding dramatically refocused attention on the role of chimerism. Because Starzl's patients had not been given donor cells, the chimeric cells he discovered could only have reached them as passengers migrating from the donor organ. Most of the patients were off all immunosuppressive drugs, thus appearing to be tolerant. The crucial role of chimerism was at first controversial, but is now widely accepted. It strongly supports Starzl's concept of a two-way paradigm that tolerance is the result of the response of coexisting donor and recipient cells each to the other. As Tom Starzl approaches his ninth decade, he continues to go to work every day, always accompanied in his office by his beloved dogs. Although he's grateful for the opportunity to spend more time with Joy, his wife of 34 years, he often finds this difficult since he remains so busy with research, writing, lecturing, and accepting awards. His bibliography of more than 3,000 scientific publications continues to increase. This has made him, by a wide margin, the world's most cited medical scientific author. Tom Starzl is certainly the most widely honored living surgeon. In the last few years, to his more than 200 other named awards, three have been added that no other living surgeon can claim. The National Medal of Science, the Lasker Award, and election to membership in the National Academy of Sciences. A fitting close to this session might be Starzl's own comments on the progress that's been made in transplantation in his time and its impact on the field of medicine. Of course, much of this progress is attributable to him. What looked to be a hopeless uh, dream, fantasy, uh, has become a regular and very reliable service. Uh, uh, it, it's a, a process that essentially was complete by 1990 and since then there's been some little fine-tuning but it's gotten so good that um, uh, the only limit to transplantation is the fact that there aren't enough organs. Um, it transformed the uh, 
philosophy within one or two generations that guides medicine because uh, until the last 40 or 50 years um, if you had somebody with end-stage heart disease or liver disease or kidney disease there was really nothing you could do except try to squeeze out the last day of life sustaining function and that's all she wrote and then all of a sudden uh, turn into the next chapter and you can replace the whole engine not just a spark plug or two uh, so it, it just it totally changed the philosophy uh, uh, by which medicine is practiced